Thank you very much. Uh alaikum again. Sorry, I am not very formally dressed. It's uh, 11.45 p.m., almost midnight here. So it's uh, very late for me. I usually sleep around 9, 10 o'clock and wake up at 5 o'clock. So I'm sorry if I am uh, a little bit slow. Uh, Swell by asked me to talk about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with some of the background of um, uh, surgical lung volume reduction. So I'll try to, to cover that in the next 30 minutes or so, and then I'll leave some minute, some time for questions if you might have. So these are my disclosures. I work for multiple industries as a consultant and uh, uh, other organization. Um, you already heard quite a bit about COPD in different aspects, and you probably have a very good idea of uh, um, how emphysema uh, sort of uh, uh, represents itself in patients, in different patient populations. So two thirds of the patients generally have homogeneous emphysema, which is very uh, counterintuitive because most of the people think that emphysema is upper lobe predominant, but it's only one third of the patients that are upper lobe dominant. And then in alpha one and trips and deficiency, uh, it's lower lobe predominant, but it's at least heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Um, and then, um, as you all know, um, the NET trial uh, looked extensively into surgical lung volume reduction. Um, both it usually was bilateral lung volume reduction in heterogeneous emphysema, and it was thought to be a revolution in the treatment of emphysema, but it unfortunately didn't turn out to be that. And the reasons are that of all the patients who had severe emphysema, uh, only people with upper low predominant and low exercise tolerance had benefit from lung volume reduction. And then a little bit uh, benefit was seen in people who had upper low predominant and low exercise tolerance. But people who had uh, homogeneous emphysema, which is non-upper lobe or diffuse emphysema and high exercise tolerance, there was no real benefit of emphysis, of doing lung volume reduction surgery. And uh, not to mention all the complications associated with lung volume reduction surgery, I still deal with them. Honestly, I have a patient in the hospital right now that I'm dealing with who had lung volume reduction surgery never healed, had persistent bronchopleural fistula, and I had to go in and put valves in that patient to block the bronchopleural fistula. The surgery is fraught with complications uh, and is still after 20 some years of experience all around the country. We do maybe a few hundred surgeries a year in the entire United States. So, uh, you know, after two decades of experience, it turns out that this is theoretically a great strategy, uh, but practically it's not a very well tolerated procedure. And as a result, I'm sorry. As a result, about 15 years ago or so, we interventional pulmonologists started looking at different strategies to avoid all the complications of surgical lung volume reduction, but yet achieve the uh, collapse or removal of the upper lobe or uh, predominant emphysema lobes. And some of the things that we tried were as follows. We tried blockers and plugs, biologics, sealants, valves, coils, bypass surgeries for homogeneous emphysema and different other procedures. And over the last 15 to 18 years, um, I think I've probably participated in all of the research of these um, different technologies and all of them um, have worked out in some fashion, some have failed. So Bronco's technology airway bypass was a very, unique trial where we used to put holes in the lungs and put tiny stents in the airways to allow um, all the trap air to leak, come out and deflate the hyperinflated volume trap lung. 
Unfortunately, those holes that we created uh, didn't last very long and got plugged. Although we put antifibrotic coated stents, but those stents got clogged. So this study failed miserably. Um, valves worked really well and they are now approved in the United States and most of the countries around the world. Coils are approved, but they are really having a hard time working very well, so they're not reused very much. Uh, plugs were used in Japan um, because it was developed by Dr. Watanabe from Japan, but the rest of the world doesn't use them anymore. The, the philosophy uh, or the concept behind bronchoscopic or surgical lung volume reduction is to basically either physically remove that part of the lung or anatomically make them dysfunctional and redirect all the air going into the upper lobes to the lower lobes or the middle lobe on the right side. And that is the basic premise on which this the whole process or procedure works. You either physically remove the lobes with surgical lung volume reduction, or by putting one-way valves, you block off those lobes so the air get transferred or redirected to the lower or middle lobes. And then uh, as the air goes down to the healthier parts of the lung, the healthier parts of the lung, then compensate and reinflate or inflate more because the upper lobes are collapsed now. And then as soon as the air goes there, oxygen goes there, the blood flow also starts to go there. And now you are sort of hyper-utilizing the healthier lungs and not utilizing the unhealthy lungs. So you are doing away with the dead space, basically. The two valves which are approved by FDA or federal drug uh, agency in the US are the aspiration valves and the Zephyr valves. So we have used both of them very, very frequently. Um, and here's a video which will show you how these valves are placed. So these valves are placed with flexible bronchoscopy, so no incision, no cuts. The stents are loaded into, valves are loaded into the bronchoscope and then we deploy them. These are one-way valves, so they allow air to come out of the trapped lobe, but prevents air from going into the uh, defected lobe. And once the lobes are deflated, then most of the air is redirected. The good thing about this valve is that if you have complications such as persistent pneumothorax, you can remove these valves. They're not very difficult to remove. This is the aspiration valve, which we use a little less commonly now. More commonly, we use Zephyr valves, um, uh, which are the duckbill valves. These are sort of umbrella valves. And a lot of workup goes in before placing the valves. Um, I see probably about 10 patients a week uh, who, are, who come to my clinic, uh, or maybe, 10 between me, my fellow, and the, AP, and the nurse practitioner. And then we end up placing valve in two of them or three of them tops. Uh, so very stringent selection criteria. Um, one of the very critical point in selecting patients besides a um, FEV1 and, F, and uh, RV and TLC, so we want RV of more than 150, TLC of more than 100, FEV1, uh, somewhere between 20 and 50%, diffusion somewhere above 20, 22%, 25%, uh, because be below that people get qualified, people qualify for lung transplantation. And the really important criteria is to look at the CT scan, and make sure their fissures are intact. And the reason is if their fissures are not intact, and we do multiple testings for this. One is a CT scan. Second is a CT scan analysis, computerized analysis. And number three, we put a balloon in the airways. It's called Chartist system. I'll show you in a minute to evaluate for collateral ventilation. And the 
purpose to make sure that there is no collateral ventilation means CV negative. Patients have to be CV negative. Is because if let's say you block the upper lobe by placing valves, but if there is a collateral ventilation from lower to the upper lobe and patients are leaking air, then uh, it doesn't serve the purpose. The lung gets completely, lung continues to get the air from the lower lobe and it never collapses. So uh, you, it doesn't serve the purpose. Um, you guys can hear me well and there's no issues, right? Can somebody just tell me yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Because I'm not sure if people can hear me or not. So this is the Chartist balloon evaluation. What we do here is we inflate a balloon in the lobe that we want to block. And then in, in the center of this balloon is a tiny catheter. So all the air that's coming out of the lobe as patient exhales is coming through this catheter, going through this machine. This machine is plotting a graph to show how the air is slowly going down. And if there is no collateral ventilation, eventually this lobe will collapse and the air coming out will dwindle down to zero. And if there is collateral ventilation, means air is getting into that lobe from the, the fissures from the other lobes, then uh, this airflow will never go down and if that means they are collateral ventilation or CV positive, that means the valves are not going to work. So here's a patient where we have blocked the valve, blocked the airway, and catheter is capturing all the air and plotting a graph. So here's how it is. Now is we're measuring the... So you can see that the air coming out of the lobe with each breath is going down and down and down and eventually we will completely empty out that lobe. And if it empties out like this, that means there is no collateral ventilation. So we do this, it's called Chartist system evaluation or Chartist balloon evaluation. Once we establish that there is no collateral ventilation, that means if we place a valve eventually, hopefully this lobe will collapse completely and all the air going into that lobe will be redirected to the healthier lobe. And then the oxygen will follow, and then the blood flow will follow the air and that lung will collapse. And then you will have better VQ because of the healthier lung getting air, oxygen, and the blood. So you will have a much better VQ as opposed to this lobe, which is so defected. So you see that air is slowly going down to almost zero. No air is coming out anymore. It means that low is empty and blocked. So prior to doing the bronchoscopic lung bond reduction, we did multiple trial. This was one of the largest trial called called REACH trial. It used the spiration valve, the umbrella valve. There were 295 patients who were screened, 107 subjects were eligible for randomized two to one prospective multi-center, multinational trial. Um, 66 patients were treated and 33 were control groups. So 33 people or two to one randomization patients went into, went and had a bronchoscopy and they were never told whether they got the valves or not. So it's a sham controlled bronchoscopy. They had a bronchoscopy. We went in, we made all the same noises and everything and came out. And then they were sent home. And we followed them for the next year without telling them whether they have the valves or not. So it's a true, true sham controlled bronchoscopy. The primary endpoints that we were looking for were FEV1 changes in the first three months and the secondary endpoints for MRC, TLC, RV, et cetera, 600 watt. The inclusion criteria, as I mentioned, was that they should have MRC scale of more than two, means relatively sick people, FEV1 less than 45%, TLC more than 100, RV more than 150, and then emphasis a score based on that computerized system uh, analysis called Stratex more than 40, and then they should be heterogeneous, means the difference between this emphysema score between the upper and lower lobe 
should be about 15% or more, and their fissures should be intact. If fissures are not in, even if the fissures were intact on the CT analysis, we still did charters below evaluation. Exclusions were that if somebody had pulmonary hypertension, we just never did the procedure, we don't do the procedure. Now in our clinical practice, we're getting much braver. We have much more experience. So we do people with higher pulmonary pressure, it's 50, 55. And this is RVSP. This is not really the pulmonary artery mean pressure. Um, and then patients who had infections or allergy to nickel and titanium because the valves are made of nickel, nickel and titanium. A uh, large bullous uh, disease was considered as a contraindication because if the bullets are very large, they tend to, to rupture when we collapse the lobe and then they give us large pneumothoraces. Secondary endpoints that I mentioned was FEV1 more than 15, total lung volume went down significantly, St. George's respiratory questionnaire scores more than 4%. Uh, COPD assessment, CAT scores, improvement, six-minute walk improvement, and all that. So um, um, so the valves that we placed uh, in the study, uh, majority of them were large valves. The valves come in different sizes, five, six, seven millimeters. So you can see we, we, we tried to put larger valves in larger airways. And most of the valves ended up uh, getting placed into the left lower lobe. So remember, again, that the benefit of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction as opposed to surgical lung volume reduction is that we're not just committed to doing upper lobes. We were doing lower lobes, and now we do homogeneous emphysema too. And several studies have shown that homogeneous emphysema responds just as good to the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction as the uh, upper lobe predominant or heterogeneous emphysema. So the results of the study um, is that we had significant improvement in FEV1. Um, this is the change in FEV1 at one month, three months, and six months. And then that the uh, primary uh, objective or goal was to have 15% increase in FEV1, which is what we see here. And even after three and six months, we had more than 10% or close to 10% FEV1 improvement. And I'll show you more studies which showed that the beneficial effect of the procedure lasted actually beyond six months to one and two years. And uh, this is the improvement in six minute walk test so six minute walk test improved by 15 to 20, almost 20 meters at one month, 25 meters at three months, and then again, 20 meters at six months. So initially the patients were so deconditioned that they couldn't, uh, it took them some time to regain their muscle strength and their stamina. But once they got that in 90 to 100 days. They were doing more than 25 meters more walking. Uh, and their SGRQ scores went down significantly. Uh, anything below four was considered very positive for our trial and for most of the clinical trials in respiratory medicine. These people went down to minus 10 and minus eight at six months. Um, now, this is very interesting that, uh, and I'll show you a couple of more studies where we had very significant complications. Um, but again, it depends on how we describe complications and how we handle them. So total uh, severe um, adverse effects uh, in about 25% of the patients. Uh, and then the most significant one was pneumothorax. And they're saying they've sort of distributed it in a funny way, but look at the total number of pneumothoraces happening, happening in these patients. One and a half percent here, 6.1% here, and then a couple of percent and six and a six point one percent here. So totally we're talking about nine, 10% of pneumothoraces. So one out of 10 patients will have a pneumothorax. Now keep this in mind, I'll show you a couple other slides. The other big issue was the exacerbation of COPD, 7.6%, 7 
uh, and then other pneumonias and other things. So now let's look at another trial, which is done with a different kind of valve called Zephyr valve. Zephyr is the duck bill valve, which doesn't look like an umbrella. Again, prospective, randomized, multi-center, multinational trial, two to one randomization, 24 sites around the world. We were part of their study. Uh, primary outcome, again, improvement in FEV1 of 15% at one year. So they're going beyond six months now. And secondary endpoints of six minute walk, St. George respiratory questionnaire and other things. Again, FEV1, if you look at 45 days, it goes above 15% improvement and gradually at one year, it comes down to 10%. So even after one year, there's 10% improvement in FEV1. Similarly, RV goes down almost 600 cc's on 45 days and then it stays more than 400 cc's at one year. So very significant improvement. St. George questionnaire, remember I mentioned minus four is considered really good. These guys had 10 at three months and maintained eight minus eight uh, at 12 months. Six minute walk test. Some of the patients really kept improving their uh, stamina and exercise tolerance to develop muscle strength went to pulmonary rehab. So you will see that there, um, some of them had pretty significant improvement in their six minute walk as the time went on. But in this trial, you will see that uh, well, we're not the complications, but again, these are the ones, blue pe blue uh, bars are patients who were treated with endobronchial valves and yellow were controls. So you will see that total lung volume reduction was significant, 84%. Um, and then rest of the parameters, BOAD, MRC, six-minute walk, SGRQ, all improved significantly in people who were treated. Now here, if you look at this trial, this is the Zephyr valve trial. Look at the pneumothorax rate. Pneumothorax happened in 26.6% of the patients, one out of four patients, which is really a very substantial issue. And I'll tell you because I do it on my daily practice. I rounded on four of my patients who had lung volume reduction today. Um, and then um, so, and then to further, you know, sort of tease out who develops pneumothorax, when and how it's managed, you would see that most of the pneumothoraces happen in the first three to four days, and then they kind of die down. And then if you look at how they were managed, dark blue are chest tubes, light magenta is chest tube only, I'm sorry, dark is chest tube and valve removal and the medium blue magenta is chest tube only, and then light is observation. So most of them required chest tube placement and some of them required valve placement. Now we have learned over the last couple of years that valve removal um, is not really necessary quickly. We have with experience in the study, in the study people were panicking a lot because it was a relatively new concept. This is sort of a long-term follow-up of these patients for two years now. And again, we're seeing that the results in FEV, this is RV, FEV1, and six-minute walk. So the effects, good effects are lasting up to two years. You can see that. So which is very significant that these are the patients who really have no other options um, because when we see these patients in our multidisciplinary conference, we're three groups of people looking at them, surgeons, we, interventional pulmonologists, and pulmonary transplant doctors. We're literally figuring out who should treat this patient, who would serve this patient best. But these patients are so far gone in their disease that we're talking about transplantation just as we're talking about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. 
So if you look at bronchoscopic lung volume reduction as opposed to, or in comparison to surgery, these guys, I mean, in bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, we're just doing bronchoscopy, flexible bronchoscopy and general anesthesia, no cuts, no transplants, no chest tubes, no cutting chest, no lifetime of immunosuppressants, renal failures, and no long hospital stays. So this is our program at University of Colorado. <laughs> it's funny how I came up with this name, EAT, as one night I was setting up the meeting for next week for emphysema, for, for, for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And, and my daughter, who is who likes genetics, uh, she's a college student. She's walked by and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm setting up a conference for advanced, for the management of emphysema. And she said, oh, it's easy. It's emphysema advanced therapies, EAT. So that's how we came up with the name EAT. And for the last six years, we have this conference every month in our hospital, uh, which is a multidisciplinary conference, with lung transplant, CD surgery, emphysema doctors, and IP. We all sit together. We discuss all the patients and we decide who is the who will serve the patients best. An important thing to remember is this is the, the, the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery does not preclude patients from surgical lung volume reduction or transplantation. It can work as a bridge to lung transplantation. You can place valves in people who are waiting for lung transplant or who are uh, yet not severe enough for lung transplantation. And then they can go for lung transplantation later on. Uh, same for the surgical. They can wait now because it's such a minimally invasive procedure. It is very protocolized. We have a very standardized approach. We have a nurse practitioner who runs our practice. We review these cases uh, with all the surgeons and transplant people, and we decide what is the best management strategy. And then we have an extensive uh, uh, algorithm through which we decide who will go for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. When we do it, as I mentioned to you earlier, most of these develop emphysema in the first three to four, I'm sorry, pneumothorax. We tell them that one in four patients is going to develop pneumothorax. And the way I discuss it with my patient is I tell them that it's not really a complication. That's the problem, right? If we just keep telling patients that, oh, this is a complication, then they will worry about it and the whole perception changes. It is not a complication because if, if you were going for a surgical lung volume reduction, you're guaranteed to come out with one or two chest tubes. And you're guaranteed to stay in the hospital for somewhere between four or five days to 10, 15 days because that's an expectation. But when we do this, medical people, we tell patient, oh, no, no, we don't want to have pneumothorax because we're medical people. We don't like to put chest tubes and keep you in the hospital. So I tell my patients right off the bat when I interview them and when I tell them that they will have procedure is number one, they might go to the operating room and may not get a valve because if I do chartist evaluation before the valve placement and if they are CV positive, I don't put the valves. Number two, they're going to stay in the hospital for four nights because that's the time where they have the highest risk for pneumothorax. Number three, uh, one in four will have pneumothorax. It is not a complication. It's, a, it's just an expected outcome of one. Of, it happens in only 26% of the patients. If it happens, we'll put a chest tube and we'll put you in the hospital for the next week or so. Um, each patient leaves the hospital, leaves the operating room with a kit, pneumothorax kit, which stays with them until they're discharged. And we put them in the uh, step-down unit, which is part of the critical care. And they have 24 seven IP and critical care coverage. This is our room where we put the valves in patients or do all the procedure. This is our interventional pulmonology suite, um, which is basically an operating room. We can turn this patient into a surgical suite. And when I'm not using it, I use it on Fridays and Tuesday afternoons and Thursdays. The rest of the time, surgeons are doing all kinds of surgeries in there. So if we had pneumothorax or bleeding or some other complication, we can do whatever we want. We open up patient's neck and do trachs there. We put chest tubes there. We do all kinds of things in there. So it's a um, hybrid unit. 
this is our one of the earlier patients. So this was a patient who uh, was a 66 year old woman who had FEV1 of 27, TLC of 112. These are the uh, requirements, and this these were her numbers. TLC of 112, DLC of 44, RV of 191, RV, TLC of 70%, six minute walk of 158 meters. And her, she didn't have formerly hypertension. She didn't have any bullets. She had quit smoking a long time ago. So we did the Chartist evaluation, or this is another evaluation. And we found out that her right upper lobe had emphysema score of 68, right middle had emphysema score of uh, whatever that is, low. Uh, this is the fissure F. Fissure is 99% intact. And the emphysema score was 34 in the lower lower middle lobe. So it's a pretty good target because it fits the criteria. Number one, it's heterogeneous disease. The difference between the upper and lower lobe and middle lobe is more than 15. Actually here it's almost 30 because it was 34 emphysema score in the upper lobe. Upper lobe was 68 and lower lobe was 34. So the difference is 34, which is more than heterogeneity. And the fissures are very intact. On the left side, the fissure is not very good. Fissure is only 88%. So this is a risk for collateral ventilation and then failure of the procedure. Uh, and then the emphysema score was 57 and uh, hydrogenity uh, was about um, 34%. So hydrogenity was good, but the fissure was not good. Um, this gives you further details of each lobe. So this is how we decide which lobe we're going to block. So a lobe that has highest emphysema score next to a lobe which has the low emphysema score and the difference is more than 15 and there is an intact fissure. So then we did the right upper lobe. We did the measurements of the valve. There are two sizes of valves that we placed, emphysis, uh, emphysis valves or Zephyr valves, size four and five. Let's see if I have a video to show you. Yeah, this is a video. So here we are uh, measuring the valve size that what valve will be placed in the right upper lobe. Or maybe we are placing the valve here. Yeah, we are placing the valve. So after the measurements, we placed a valve under bronchoscopy. So this is a duck bill valve. You can see that. It allows air to come out, and I'll show you in the next slide. So see the valve is opening when patient is breathing out, and then valve shuts down when breathing, patient trying to breathe in. So it's, see that? It closes when patient tries to breathe in, so no air can go in. It opens up and patient is trying to breathe out. So it's sort of a one-way valve. So this was pre-procedure. Uh, remember, we did the right upper lobe. This was immediately post-procedure. See the difference in the diaphragm? So she's already undergoing atelectasis of the right upper lobe. See the right upper here and see the right upper here. The upper lobe is collapsing slowly. Day five, which is when we discharge patient, look at the upper lobe is completely collapsed. Look at the diaphragm gone up. Look at the volume of the right lung versus volume of the left lung. And look at before procedure, the volume of the right lung. So this is truly lung volume reduction, but bronchoscopic, not surgical. And then day 30th, she's still, now her lower lobe is expanding and um, um, filling up the space left by the collapse of the right upper lobe but the right lower lobe is much healthier. Remember, emphysema score was really low. So the VQ is going to be much better because air is going to, and we did calculations and it's about 300 cc's of air that is transferred from upper lobe to the lower lobe. So PFTs before BLVR, bronchoscopic reduction and PFTs one month later. Her FEV1 went from 27 to 47. Her TLC didn't change much. 
Our DLCO went from 44 to 57. RV went from 191 to 159. RVTLC went from 70 to 56. Six minute walk improved from 158 to 240. So she could literally walk almost 90 meters more after one month of lung wall reduction. And she came to me, it's just amazing. She lives about 70 miles from Denver where I work in Colorado Springs and she was just a completely different person. So if you are if you are looking at patients for possible bronchoscopic lung volume reduction assessment, so you're, you could do some of the basic assessments before referring those patients, confirm the diagnosis. We were very stringent about people having more than 12% of reactivity because they might have asthma and we were rejecting them. Um, but again, as we do more and more, we're learning that there are some of the patients have overlap syndrome between COPD and emphysema. They could have 12 or 15 or 20% reversibility with bronchodilators. That doesn't mean they do not have emphysema. As long as they're optimally treated for their reactive airway disease or, or asthma, we will do the valves. Make sure they're non-smokers and all these criterias. Uh, and once they fulfill all these criterias, you can call us and send the patient to us. And we'll be happy to do the valve. Thank you very much.